Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Threat Talk. I'm your host, Bob Hansman, and with me today is Michael Zuckerman, a consulting senior product marketing manager who works with our Infoblox Cyber Intelligence Unit, or the CIU, and he does this every quarter to collect all the details on the top threats for that particular period. Uh, welcome back, Michael. Thank you, Bob. Glad to be here. Glad to have you, because I also just got a, a peek at the report, which they just wrapped up, um, and... It looks like the, looks like the CIU is pretty busy. I mean, there are three major cyber threat advisories just from one quarter, and the report also goes a lot farther than just you know. Usually, reports like this have their top ten threats, and this has got a lot of stuff in it. That's right, Bob. It's been a really hectic quarter, and unfortunately, threat actors have started to broach new milestones. Um, the research team, the security research team that produces the advisories has been, you know, busy night and day. Uh, they write about whatever's happening on that cyber war front pretty much in real time as it happens. And the quarterly report is no more nor less than a consolidation of that information with some trend analysis and background information to help, you know, the reader connect the dots. But it's very fact-based and it's very real time. And so it's been, a, unfortunately, a very busy quarter. Yeah, and, and like you said, this is being produced by the actual engineers uh, doing the research. You know, um, so what I the other thing I notice is it's there's a big emphasis on actionable here, and that word is unfortunately often tossed around when any kind of company releases any kind of information um, on security. So, um, you know, I, I saw that and I was digging through, and I was also very pleased there. I mean, there's like two pages of of you know all the things you could do um, that you should consider around ransomware, for example, two pages of this stuff. Um, and unlike other reports, it's not just limited to the stuff that Infoblox does. It's fairly comprehensive. Yeah, for sure. Um, actually, for each CCB, as people reference it, you'll see specific mitigations and very detailed information, depending upon what we're talking about. Um, so for sure. Uh, it was really great to work with a research team that wasn't focused on sharing, you know, the next scary story, but really on fact-based security research. So the resulting advice in the report is more extensive and includes references to some of the latest developments in government areas like, like it, the NIST publication. Ah. Um, so just to cover that a little bit more, in June, NIST published a prelim draft report uh, it's called 8374, but the net of it is uh, just a few weeks ago, they put out a report that defines ransomware profiles and identifies the security objectives specified as part of their framework to prevent, respond, you know, mitigate, recover from ransomware, right? And so that's a great document that we spoke to that just came out. And so those things are actionable for you. You know, you, it's hard for a lot of people out there to track everything the government does. We do. And so you can you know, get to that information and then react to it because it's giving you good advice and it's timely advice. You need to you need to take it to heart now. Yeah. And while, you know, the CIU includes their own recommendation stuff, I, I noticed the, the NIST reference. And there's also some stuff on CISA, who also just did something last month in June. That's right. So in June, too, you know, the Fed really has the federal government has stepped up right on a, on a long front of activity. So at the end of June, CISA released a new ransomware readiness assessment module as part of their, you know, cyber security eval tool set. And it's kind of a guide that steps you through uh, a process to evaluate, you know, your cybersecurity practices. It's pretty flexible. It can be applied to, you know, infotech as well as industrial systems, right? Which are, you know, industrial control systems are very different, right? And it's got, you know, all the standards and things you need to know. Uh, beyond that, um, you know, I think you were the one that emailed me, right? Uh, CISA has also broken out a whole new section of their website on ransomware. And I've only seen it for the first time in the past week and a half or so. So there's, there's a lot of new stuff that can give you some of the weapons you need to stand tall and, you know, hang in there in the fight against ransomware. And it's coming from the government. Yeah, a lot of, lot of resources there. Um, but the other thing that I, I also noticed, of course, going through it, and I'm sure you, you ran into this, is that 
I mean, everybody's been talking about ransomware for years. As a matter of fact, I remember when it first came out, it was a big hype thing. Everybody's talking about it. And after about a year, um, I was hearing back from CISOs that if anybody mentions ransomware anymore, I'm just shutting them off because I'm tired of hearing about it. Um, uh, because it was the new thing at the time. It wasn't the big thing that it is today. It was just the newest thing. And of course, marketing jumped all over it. Um, and then it's come back because, of course, I think everybody everybody knows just how bad it's been here recently. Um, but the research report, you mentioned this is all data driven. Um, and you mentioned the CCBs, which are the individual reports as a new virus strain or something comes out. Uh, the CIU will issue what they call a CCB uh, with details about it. Um, and, and I noticed most of those were also ransomware uh, related. So you're not just rehashing old stuff. This is actually new stuff about new things and, and how the ransomware whole industry is changing. Is that correct? Yes, it is. You know, so when you wake up in the morning and you think about your quarterly report, you really don't expect to do ransomware again and again and again, right? <laughs> yeah. And in Q4, ransomware gets a mention. In Q1, ransomware's you know out there. And this quarter was just particularly hard because of some of the potentially devastating high-profile attacks. You know, one fifth of our beef production was shut down for a week or two or three. Uh, you know, half of our uh, oil pipelines were shut down. You know, so so these things have started to take on a much bigger life and really become, in some ways, you know, threatening to our normal way of life. Um, on the other side of the coin, you know, the research that we present um, when it's when it's wrung out is designed to be low on you know the the more typical marketing influence you've seen. Um, it's designed to be as fact based as possible, and um, and not only use our research, but use the research of others. So for instance, um, the Verizon 2021 data breach report spoke to, I recall, 10% of all breaches are now driven by ransomware. And Cyber Reason, who we also quoted, uh, released a study that showed 66% of organizations are reporting a significant loss of revenue after ransomware attack. I mean, this, this whole trend around ransomware is, is worsening and the effectiveness of their tools and their attacks are, are growing bigger than life in the eyes of the public. So ransomware right now is, if not the single most prevalent threat that security teams are facing, one of those top two or three, depending upon what industry you're in and where you're located geographically. And it's causing a lot of harm in the environment and, and getting the attention of the government and, uh, you know, Efforts to to deal with it are stepping up on all fronts, in some cases by you know orders of magnitude. Yeah, and I I I, I want to get more into some of the government activity because there's been a lot of impact on the ransomware industry. If you want to think of it as a as a business industry in and of itself, ransomware. Um, the uh, you know the insurance industry though has also been really talked about a lot, and you were talking about the Cyber Reason report which um, I was glad you called that one out. I watched for a variety of those reports and I'd missed that one. When I was digging into it, they were talking about how, um, you know, insurance companies are, are the ones that are currently on the line a lot for, you know, these ransoms. Um, now, for our listeners who don't recall, we had um, Krupa Shrivastan on our uh, about two episodes ago um, talking about cyber insurance policies and Paying the ransomware is typically a writer. It's an extra you have to buy. Your basic cyber insurance doesn't cover it. It covers things like, you know, if you have to buy or rent equipment or if you need to hire expert consultants to come in and help because you need more manpower to do a recovery or something like that. And it's not just for ransomware. It's for, you know, we had a, a fire in, in part of our, our data center or something like that. It covers those kinds of things. And if you want to have it cover the payment, you, it's a separate thing you have to buy. But even that, now that we've had $11 million, $4.4 million uh, ransoms being paid, that's gotten pretty big. And in your report, you actually, um, this isn't just US-centric, you actually went to France and talked about a French insurance group and how they're responding to this. You want to share some of those details? Yes. Uh, first, I would say that Krupa Srivatsen is a subject matter expert 
on how the insurance industry interacts with this. Mm -hmm. And so your comments were very appropriate. Um, I was surprised to find that AXA, which is a highly reputable, large French insurance group, they're usually in the top five globally on net premiums written or other metrics, right? And in mm -hmm. June, uh, AXA announced that they would stop selling in France cyber insurance policies that would reimburse you know, clients for extorted ransomware payments. Now let's have that sink in here, right? Because AXA is an insurance market leader. Um, you know, you don't want to read into it too far, but its actions might signal the beginning of a larger trend to reduce the incentives for threat actors, right? Because if you ask the FBI, they say, don't pay ransoms, right? Mm -hmm. So most companies don't have a discretionary budget set aside for millions in ransomware payments. You know, it's not something that we do when we we work on the next year plan, right? So they, they just can't afford to appease threat actors' ransom demands. And the story was that AXA suspended the option in response to the concerns raised by the French justice and cybersecurity uh, government officials that held a round table on the topic. And in 2020, you know, I mean, just in 2020 alone, the impact of ransomware in France was estimated to be billions of dollars. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's more comment on it. Um, but, you know, on the alternate side of the fence, right, the FBI has been really consistent. I mean, Chris Ray came out in June again and said, you know, as politely as he could in a spiritually uplifting way that the Bureau discourages ransomware payments to threat actors because it, it just, it just fuels the business. So it's the policy of the FBI that companies should not be paying the ransom for a number of reasons. And, uh, and so, you know, paying them, you know, builds up the adversary activity pipeline. And, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question to, to get our arms around. But in general, you know, now we've seen a big insurance company drop support, in, at least in France, and the FBI has been consistent in, in, in their direction on this topic. Yeah, I, I, I got a chuckle out of your reference that it was a spiritually uplifting statement. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, and so here it's happening in France. And of course, the insurance company is responding to changes on the political front. The government of France is, is looking at measures. Um, I've seen a number of articles about the EU in general looking at, at putting in measures for all their member countries. Um, the United States has several states considering because at the federal level, they, they haven't really gone far down this, but they're letting every state decide. And several states have measures that are being voted on now to say that you can't make ransomware payments if you're in our state. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of discussion about whether that's swinging the ball too far. You know, should there still be some exceptions? Um, but, uh, no, there, I mean, you can't argue with the math that if there's no money in it, they won't do it. Um, but somebody's going to uh, pay the price uh, in the short term, and that'll be interesting, if not painful, to watch unfold. Now, um, we're already halfway through our time, and so because of time constraints, we can't really get into the details of like the Colonial Pipeline, JBS, USA Food, or even the Kasey attacks that um, you cover all those in some detail in the report. But these events put a spotlight on what happened to Darkseid and Revel with some interesting results, like they're not here anymore. Right. Well, this is the beginning of, of really what is a long discussion. So, so, you know, Colonial Pipeline really got the U.S. government's attention, right? So you're talking about one-fifth of an industry shut down or one-half of an industry shut down. And so, you know, the Fed has really, the, I say the Fed as in the federal government has really stepped up. Um, but think of it this way. Just look at what the, at the Fed did. So in April, Jerome Powell noted that mm -hmm. the greatest risk he sees to financial issues is cyber risk. You know, it wasn't COVID. It wasn't, you know, someone printing digital currency or doing something like that. It was cyber risk. Yeah. And, you know, Jerome Powell's view is shared by multiple governments and private businesses, you know, pretty much everywhere. Later in June, the Justice Department officials, you know, started putting out a lot of 
cautionary material to U.S. business leaders about um, the increasing, you know, barrage of ransomware attacks, right? I mean, the Justice Department almost organized a war room-like coordinated response to rally business, right? Um, there's a deputy attorney general, Lisa Monaco. She put out a memo um, that asked all U.S. prosecutors to report all ransomware investigations centrally. And the interesting thing is that the ransom, the memo was cited as saying that ransomware is an urgent threat to the nation's interests. So that's a big change. You know, there's a war room effort and Monaco's kind of been on point for the DOJ's efforts about ransomware. She noted the massive attacks against, you know, Colonial and JBS were representative of a lot of stuff going on every day. Well, and, and I want uh, to interject. You, you also mentioned an important thing that all of these officials um, from various uh, U.S. government agencies, uh, you know, financial sector, um, our power grid and infrastructure, um, all these different areas, the reporting seems to be something they keep bringing up. And um, while I know you don't go into that in great detail, uh, you and I have talked about that in the past that really, um, you know, we're only still seeing some of the big incidents because a lot of companies are still handling this stuff and not even bringing it to light. They're just handling it on their own, doing it on the side. And we don't really get the visibility that we should. Um, and uh, I think that's an important part here. So um, yeah. it's just is shocking to me how, how much the things we've been advocating for four or five years are now coming to the point where you absolutely have to. And now the governments are looking at mandating them. Yes. You know, it, it, it really people don't want to report on these activities unless they feel it necessary for legal reasons or compliance reasons, because the fact is that a ransom event can impact your revenue. It can damage your brand. And so whether, whether government or, or private um, will tend to see the least amount of possible release of information other than as required by law, you know, no one wants to talk about a ransomware event. On the other hand, um, you know, a lot of businesses feel pressure to report it, um, notwithstanding compliance, because they feel they have an obligation to their customers and shareholders, not only to say, well, it happened, but, you know, we're better today. Here are the things we've done to prevent it in the future. But it's, it's, it's tough. A lot of the information is not out there. Now, and, and of course, I mentioned earlier, we'd get back to it. Um, these are all attacks that had uh, the involvement of either Dark Side or Revel. Um, and what I thought was interesting is that, you know, these attacks, they were big. They were noted, as we just finished talking about, government took big notice, um, issued, you know, presidential um, announcements and activated parts of the government uh, defense. Like you said, a war room kind of posture took place. And I expected them to, you know, be finding these people and pulling it out. And that's not really what happened. They just kind of, I mean, Darkseid announced they shut down and, and then Rebel just disappeared. Um, but it is having an impact, perhaps not what we had hoped or expected, but it is having an impact. Right. Well, Darkseid has not emerged unscathed from the attack on Colonial Pipeline. So the U.S. government law enforcement really landed what I would call a strong counterpunch and pulled back, clawed back, recovered 2.3 million in the Bitcoin paid in the colonial pipeline ransom. And somehow US officials identified a virtual currency wallet that the dark side threat actors used to collect the payment from colonial pipeline. And, you know, the activities associated with the seizure of a cryptocurrency ransom paid to the threat actors is probably the first publicly revealed instance of this that I've seen by any U.S. government agency. Thus far, the security and confidentiality of cryptocurrency transactions really has been a key enabler for ransomware actors. So, so things have just changed. Yeah. Then, of course, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the whole bit uh, chain kind of concept that it's not as secure as, as we, uh, all thought it was that they were able to get in there. Um, interestingly enough, um, I know it was Brian Krebs, who I believe broke the news. Several others have, have noted the connection that the amount they were able to claw back, like you said, um, from this uh, that attack on Colonial Pipeline was what they normally would pay to affiliates. So what it means is that, you know, Darkseid still made their money, 
but the people who probably hired them and 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 used the tool cuz got to keep in mind dark for our listeners dark side and revel are both they provide a service they don't actually do the attacks we keep using their name cuz that's the tool that's being used but the people who hired dark side and used their tool they lost all their money here that we we got back but because dark side's a little you know few chains or links in the chain down we kind of missed uh you know that detail but you know it's also opening up some things about bitchain not being secure i think that's yeah. an interesting comment on security nobody everything a time a new technology comes out they say oh this is going to be more secure than anything in the past no it's just going to be secure until they find the weaknesses right so, no, well to say it oh go ahead yeah so so you know that's the big question right um when it comes to, you know, how are these transactions getting broken, right? There's a lot of communications. And for any communication, there's always a way to be the man in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. And so nobody, I mean, nobody is talking about the ways and means of how any of that was done. My contacts know nothing, which is pretty unusual, right? Um, mm -hmm. We know from public facing media that U.S. officials, you know, identified the virtual currency wallet that dark side threat actors used. And, you know, but we've never seen this kind of stuff really seized before. And so, you know, the FBI has been sometimes able to access and obtain the encryption keys, you know, but, but nothing like this, right? And so, you know, you start to get back to, you know, what's really under the covers here. And if you go back, I'm not going to mention any specific agency, but sometime around 2013, there were some rumors about, some agency, you know, um, or two in the world that were trying to track Bitcoin transactions for reasons of terrorism. And, you know, I think over time, because of that mission that was, you know, publicly visible, I think they got really good at it, but those ways and means would never be discussed because it, it impacts everyone's security. And finally, ransomware is getting so bad that it is the same level of threat in some cases, right? You know, depending on those cases, the government has decided to use their big guns to deal with it. And that capabilities we may not have been aware of are now front and facing in the public forum and being leveraged against attackers. So those ransomware, you know, activities didn't just disappear by themselves, you know, personally, I, I would guess that some government around the world had a very substantial hand in making that happen. Well, yeah. And that was something that um, in the outline that uh, we discussed earlier around point nine, you know, we talked about how normally in the past you'd have some government agency, you know, if they, if this was guns, they'd have a room showing you all the guns laid out that they'd captured or drugs. Here's all the drugs on a table um, here. I don't know what the, 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 PCs and server hard drives, what would they lay out? Um, it's all cloud. So, um, but they would be making a show that they have the ability to stop these kinds of things. They haven't been that bold with this. Well, which, yeah, I think that means they're hiding a lot of the tools that they're using because if those tools get known, they'll be compromised. Just like most companies don't want people to know what they're using for their security. Because if you know everything that I'm using, it helps you formulate an attack to get around it. So I don't know, what are your thoughts on why we're not hearing a big brag session from some government agency? Well, you know, these government agencies are there to protect us. And I think there would be, you know, not speaking specifically to our agencies, but just any intelligence agencies in general around the world, you know, the things that they can do, they want to keep those capabilities confidential if they're targeting terrorism. And I think, you know, you, you had this, this meeting at the table, right? Imagine, you know, the head of government there and some of the intelligence agency folks at the table and some of the justice folks at the table. And they're saying, look, you know, we know how to do this, but we don't want to release our ways and means. Right. And yeah. someone else said this problem, you know, someone else at that table said this problem is so severe that it's time that we maybe revealed a little bit of the capabilities we have. And so the takeaway is, the good news is that we don't know the ways and means, but we know that the government has some powerful tools to help defend, you know, our, our enterprise and our government. And it's a warning to threat actors 
that, you know, today you may be hiding nicely someplace east of Europe or someplace else, but the government has the capacity now not only to disrupt your economic chain, but probably to reach out and grab you, you know, by name. And so I think it was, you know, well-timed, well-intended and exactly the right move at this time by the government. Yeah. And, and, you know, this isn't terribly new. Um, I recall just after the millennium, there was a case where um, they were chasing down. It was a Chinese credit card ring who hired an ex KGB agent who was living in Morocco to develop an attack. And he hired some things out to some people that he knew and contacts in Tunisia, in South Africa, in Brazil, the United States, in France. Um, and where's the other one? Um, Amsterdam. And he coordinated all these people to build this kind of a thing. And this was 20 years ago. And yeah. it still works that way. It still works that way that it's a network of, of people uh, collaborating. It's just gotten a lot more business-like. You know, they try to come up with cool names, um, you know, like Revel. Um, so, uh, but you know, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time and I want to make sure we get into some of the technical stuff. I don't want to, again, I don't want people listening to think that this report that you've put uh, all this work into is just again, scary stories and conjecture, um, around point 12 in the, the, uh, the report, you actually dig into some of the technologies that they're starting to use more and more and more. And one of them was RDP or remote desktop protocol. I was surprised that they're getting in there and not just having the tool do automatic stuff. They're actually trying to get direct remote control of something within the network that, you know, they're not just trusting it to AI and all of that. They're, they're, they got a human being looking at what's going on inside and deciding the next step of their attack. Yeah, for sure. RDP has become a highly effective and dangerous attack vector, right? Um, one study that was done a few years ago found, you know, over 10 million machines, you know, out on the internet configured with an open port, you know, 3889. Um, and, you know, threat actors can use search engines like Shodan to find out how they can get in to leverage RDP. Um, RDP, for those of you that may not be familiar with it, is the Microsoft protocol that facilitates remote connections to other computers. And this connection almost always happens over TCP port 3389. So that's why searching Shodan caused problems. RDP you know, gets you network access over this encrypted channel and allows users to remotely control Microsoft Windows devices. The, the basic capability of RDP is to you know, transfer the the monitor output from the remote endpoint or server to the RDP client and the keyboard and mouse controls from the client to the remote endpoint or server. And it, it gives you a nice little GUI and it, it works well to do what it does. When you, you move away from the dark side here to the, to the light, right? RDP was, mm -hmm. is used by employees to access their office computers from endpoints. Um, you know, it comes with Microsoft windows. It support Apple Macs. It's become a standard protocol and actually got used perhaps more than it should during the, you know, the pandemic. Threat yeah. actors gain access to RDP servers by finding these open ports and using just default passwords most of the times on servers that have not been, not been upgraded. There are lots of small, medium businesses or mid-sized enterprises that have RDP servers outward facing. They don't even know it. They set up a bunch of stuff and it's out there. Um, if it's a worthy target, you know, threat actors can use a brute force technique to break in or they just use, you know, you can download an open source password cracker and it will work because they're just not watching the traffic there. And once they're in and they escalate their privileges to that of an admin, then then you're snake bit. Right. Anything's yeah. possible. They have full control of your machine. They can encrypt files, um, you know, and so on and so forth. So it's a big administrative challenge for a lot of companies. And um, a lot of IT teams are, are sometimes just unaware that this is public facing or they just haven't updated or patched the servers in years. So, so RDP is a definite dangerous threat vector and one that companies need to keep an eye on. Yeah, and there's um, also for everybody to keep in mind, there's free, free RDP, there's RD desktop, 
Um, there's a variety of these, um, like there's a, uh, an RDP client in Kali, I think, on Linux. So um, even if you don't have those things installed, you know, viruses don't just install the whole thing. They typically put in a quick little downloader. So you're surfing the web, you get an email with a link or an email with an attachment, and it could be nothing more than just go download this RDP client. So if your endpoints don't have it, you've disabled it. You've got a platform that's not Windows. It doesn't mean they can't install it. And since it's not malware, your, your antivirus and other defenses aren't going to pick it up. They're installing a public legitimate tool. And it's not until they start using that tool that it could possibly trigger any major alarms. Unless, of course, you use some of those features. This is where you get back to web filtering to block inappropriate stuff that, you know what, these RDP clients are inappropriate on the endpoints. And so you may have to start filtering for some of those things. And I want to use that as a segue to the next section, which is basically the recommendations. And as I mentioned, you go on for pages with all sorts of things from the obvious multi-factor authentication to the less obvious. Can you kind of summarize um, how did all those recommendations come about? Because they're not, all, I mean, very few of them are about Infoblox products. So how did all that stuff get in there? Well, to be clear, you know, these mitigations are, are part of a set um, of things that everyone needs to be aware of. So the CIU certainly has their recommendations and they, they always temper and expand that with the recommendations from government, whether it's CISA, whether it's NSA, whether it's NIST. And so these are general purpose recommendations um, that are important. Uh, Multi-factor authentication, right? Spam filtering to prevent phishing emails. Um, some of us get tired of it, right? We get these training sessions, but you know what? You need to keep training your users on how to handle phishing emails. Um, a lot of that traffic is going up. Uh, filtering network traffic with DNS security um, is a good way to clear out malicious IP, especially you know when you've got a lot of work from home or work remotely contingents, right? You've got one stack that can address you know, the corporate network on-premise, your cloud stuff, and certainly your, your work from home contingents, one stack, one admin, and, and, and DNS infrastructure is critical. Uh, software updates, we all know that. Uh, limit access, right? A good example was RDP I just talked about. Um, regular scans with antivirus. Yes, antivirus by itself may not be enough, but it's part of the mix, right? There are signatures you can find, they're obvious. There are signatures where you'll use machine learning based tools and other more sophisticated techniques, but you got to do it. You got to run a vulnerability scanner regularly. Um, one thing that I'm really sensitive to is Microsoft Office macro scripts, right? You know, when someone sends you something with zips that work and macro files that work, in general, you really don't want these things running on your network, right? Um, another one is allowed application listing, right? Um, what are you allowed to run, which in contrast decides what you're not allowed to run? And there's a lot more, like don't allow tour on the network, you know, those kinds of things, right? Don't allow internal tools that are just, you know, dangerous, right? Tools that IT should use, but shouldn't be in, in, your, business, in your line of business network, right? Stuff like yeah. that. And then, um, you know, I hope we can get to it, but... Um, NSA also issued a huge dir directive on protective DNS, you know, over the past quarter. Yeah, and and unfortunately, we are we are actually already over time as usual. You and I just we 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 have a ton of stuff to talk about because um, you've got <clears throat> you've got NSA references, you got um, the the CISA, and, and there's just a lot of information in the report, but it also connects to a lot of sources. So it's a good first place for anybody to start to understand what's happening on the quarter. Um, so uh, the report is going to be posted on infoblox.com under the cybersecurity unit. Um, it actually gets highlighted, I think on the banner page for a month or so. So it should be easy to find on the infoblox.com website. Um, Michael, I just wanna really thank you for your time uh, as tight as it always is. Thank you, Bob. And, and I want to thank to all of our viewers and listeners for your time. Uh, join us next time as we continue our efforts to help you stay on top of cybersecurity and ahead of cyber risks on Threat Talk.